information technology is growing exponentially. That's really my main thesis. And our intuition about the future is not exponential, it's linear. People think well, things will go at the current pace, one, two, three, four, five, and 30 steps later, you're at 30. The reality of information technology, like computers, like biological technologies now, is it goes exponentially, two, four, eight, 16. At step 30, you're at a billion. And this is not an idle speculation about the future. Uh, when I was a student at, at MIT, we all shared a computer cost tens of millions of dollars. This computer is a million times cheaper, a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion fold increase in MIPS per dollar, bits per dollar, bits of communication per dollar or per euro compared to when I was a student and we'll do it again in 25 years. And it's not just gadgets, it's also anything we can measure information technology. So the singularity comes from two implications of that. One is that we'll have hardware uh, powerful enough to simulate the human brain by 2029. And the software, the intelligence that'll come with that is also expanding exponentially as we learn more about how the human brain works. And that's also an exponential progression. And they make the case we'll have human level intelligence in a machine by 2029. Now that's not the singularity. That's the beginning of it. Ultimately, that will continue to grow exponentially. By 2045, that non-biological portion of our civilization's intelligence will expand a billion fold. Our biological intelligence is very impressive, but it's fixed. It's not going to expand. Uh, so ultimately, we'll be dominated by non-biological intelligence. The merger has already started. I mean. First of all, this is not inside my body and brain, but it's pretty close. But there are people with computers in their bodies and brains. There are computerized artificial pancreases that act just like the real organ. And what started it was the Genome Project, and that was exponential too. Halfway through the project, the skeptics saying, this isn't working. I mean, here you are seven and a half years into a 15-year project, and you finished 1% of the project. This is a failure, just like we said it was going to be. That's actually right on schedule for an exponential progression. You start out doubling little numbers. By the time you get to 1%, you're only seven doublings away from 100%, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And it, that's exactly what happened. It continued to double every year and was finished seven years later. Uh, so that was an exponential progression. Are now reverse engineering the genome to actually understand how genes produce proteins and how proteins interact with three-dimensional simulations and so on, uh, that's also progressing at an exponential pace. So we've gone from hit or miss to where we can actually sit down at a computer and with a real model and simulation of, of human biology, actually design interventions just the way you would design a new aircraft on a computer. And it's a whole different era. And this will really gain fruit very dramatically in 10, 15, 20 years from now. We have three profound overlapping revolutions, sometimes called GNR, G for genetics, which is biotechnology, N for nanotechnology, which is basically reprogramming matter and energy at the level of molecules using information processes. R stands for robotics, <clears throat> but it really refers to artificial intelligence, creating intelligent machines, whether they're robots or not. And these are interacting in many ways. Well, ultimately, every industry is certainly affected. Uh, those industries that actually become information technologies go from linear progress, one, two, three, four, five, to exponential progress, two, four, eight, sixteen. And that's a very profound change. Health and medicine is now an information technology. In terms of business models, it's already stratifying into different types of firms de-risking projects at different levels. You have lots of little companies that sit down, actually computer terminals, and design new interventions, and they may take the drug through possibly just simulator trials and pass it off to somebody else, and then somebody does animal trials, and finally there's another set of firms that do phase one FDA trials and, and so on. I think these new drugs, as we really get into the advanced part of biotechnology, are going to be so much significantly better uh, that they're going to be less risky to try, and they'll go through more quickly. If something really works dramatically, the FDA can work more quickly. The data becomes obvious more quickly. It becomes unethical not to give people 
uh, the drug. Uh, the FDA actually is starting and has a whole roadmap on using simulators uh, rather than trials. Uh, it's, it'll soon be the case that using a simulator of human biology is a better simulation of humans than animals are. And ultimately, you'll see very dramatic results because uh, these are information processes. And when we really understand how the software of life works, we can really reprogram it away from cancer, away from heart disease. Well, I think intellectual property is going to continue to be a huge issue. Uh, you know, a 20-year protection for a patent uh, that was put in place when 20 years was part of a generation, a product generation or technology generation. So you kind of get a head start. Maybe you got half a generation ahead. Uh, now, with information technology, how many generations is 20 years? I mean, in the computer industry, it's, it's at least 20. Um, so intellectual property will be very important. So Larry Page of Google and I were asked by the National Academy of Engineering <clears throat> in the United States to study the different emerging energy technologies and, and actually come up with a plan for the United States and the world f for energy. And we looked at all the different emerging energy technologies. A number of them are interesting and promising, but one that's really very exciting and that's on an exponential rise is solar energy. So it's been doubling every two years and has doubled 10 times already, very smoothly, if you look on a logarithmic scale, it's a very smooth uh, exponential rise. And it's only eight doublings away from meeting 100% of our energy needs. So I, I presented this to the Prime Minister of Israel, and uh, he said, but Ray, do we have enough sunlight to do that with? Can we double eight more times? And I said, uh, actually, we have 10,000 times more than we need. Uh, after we get done doubling eight more times in 16 years from now, uh, we'll be using one part in 10,000 of the sunlight that falls on the Earth. We could use, even with inefficient solar farms, a uh, small percentage of the world's unused deserts, and there's a lot of them in the neighborhood of Israel, uh, and produce uh, enough energy for the world uh, with a resource right now that's not used, which is deserts, which have a lot of sunlight. I've talked to some of the leaders of energy companies in the Arab oil-producing nations, and their belief is that they don't have an infinite amount of time. Uh, they think they have a couple of decades uh, where they'll continue to be tremendous demand for oil, and then they think other technologies will take over, and so their strategy is, in fact, to diversify. And you do see major energy companies making very large investments in these renewable energies, particularly solar. Electric cars uh, is the wave of the future, particularly as we find inexpensive ways of producing electricity, as we apply nanotechnology to more powerful and lightweight energy storage devices. Uh, we can actually uh, use the entire network of cars as an energy storage facility for, for society. And I also think self-driving cars is coming. Most of the experts I've talked to who are working on this technology field were less than 10 years away from where this will be uh, a very common technology. That actually can save energy. We can put more cars on the road um, and make driving a more pleasant experience, not, not to mention saving hundreds of thousands of lives per year, which are lost uh, worldwide to uh, car accidents. One area of advice that I uh, like to give is to actually take the discipline of, of writing down what the underlying technologies that affect your business will be a year from now, and two years from now, three years from now, or even every six months, which is what I do now in my projects. Uh, when I read other people's business plans, mo much of the time they kind of assume not much is going to happen over the next three, four years. Cell phones will get a little smaller, but otherwise the world will be the same as it is today. And we know that's not the case. You can look back three, four, five years ago. Most people didn't use social networks, wikis, blogs. The world was very different just a few years ago. Uh, and it's going to change even more at an even quicker pace in the years ahead. And you can't describe everything that's going to happen, but you can actually describe uh, in very precise 
terms what the underlying technologies will be, the power of computers, the power of communications, uh, what the data, data rates will be for different kinds of wireless communication and so on. So I actually take the discipline of, of writing that out. And it is small entrepreneurial groups that create the new technologies of the future. That doesn't mean it has to come from small businesses. Large businesses can also create that kind of entrepreneurial environment by setting up small groups, entrepreneurship, uh, where they create these kinds of incentives within their organizations. Uh, the kind of organization that's not going to succeed are ones that are too overly attached to the old business model. We have new organizations, you know, Google or Facebook, uh, which, you know, create whole new industries. But uh, that can come from the old industries as well. Uh, some companies, uh, like IBM, have been very successful in redefining themselves continually. Uh, you've got to be willing to, to take those kinds of risks with your entire company. I think technology has been a double-edged sword ever since we had fire and stone tools and the wheel. I mean, fire kept us warm and cooked our food, but it was also used as an instrument of war. And these new technologies are quite powerful. Uh, the same technology that we can use to reprogram biology away from cancer and heart disease could also be deployed right now by a bioterrorist to, to reprogram a biological virus to be a new weapon. Uh, in fact, I brought that uh, specter to the U.S. Army's attention. I would argue strongly that the uh, constructive applications outweigh uh, the peril. Uh, you, know, you know, people sometimes uh, long for the good old days before technology wrecked our lives, and they're living in a dream world. I suggest that they read Thomas Hobbes or even Charles Dickens as to how incredibly harsh and difficult and cruel uh, life was only two, three hundred years ago. So we've made a lot of progress. Uh, there's still a lot of suffering to, to overcome. I don't think it's, uh, it's accurate to say that these technologies are the province only of the wealthy. People say, oh, only the wealthy will have access to these tools. And I say, yeah, right, like cell phones. Uh, that, you know, five billion people have cell phones, say, 30 percent of Africans, half the farmers in China. By the time the technologies are very powerful and work really well, they're in almost everybody's hands. And it's going to be true of these health technologies as well. In fact, you can look at AIDS drugs. They were $30,000 per patient per year 15, 20 years ago and didn't work very well. And today in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's $100 per patient per year. And they work actually pretty good, pretty well. Uh, and people are getting them. Uh, so at any one point in time, there's a have-have-not divide, but the technology itself is moving in the right direction. Ultimately, these will, will be very widespread technologies. Whether it's poverty or the environment and energy or disease and longevity, uh, the answers to these challenges lies only in these exponentially growing information technologies.